Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unusor Education. Um, I would like to spend some time today and, um, how should I say it, theoretically prove, but this is not really a proof in the mathematical um, sense. Uh, it, it's a proof in physical sense, let's put it this way. Um, we will conduct some thought experiment and uh, see how this experiment leads us to um, the law of conservation of angular momentum. Um, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens, uh, presented on Unisor.com. Um, on the same site you will find uh, Math for Teens, which is basically a prerequisite for this course. It's a relatively complete course of mathematics for high school, maybe a little bit higher than that. Um, so I do suggest you to watch this lecture through this website because for every lecture the website provides complete uh, notes, details in a textual format like a like a textbook basically. And the site is completely free, no advertisement, etc. Alright, so let's talk about um, a thought experiment which um, not maybe prove but very very strongly confirms the law of uh, conservation of angular momentum, which I actually touched during the previous lecture. Okay, so let's consider this is our thought experiment. Now, let's um, uh, completely um, abstract out other uh, external forces like gravitation or, or anything, air resistance or anything else. So we consider this experiment in the space somewhere far from gravitational fields and anything else. So let's consider that we are holding two threads in our hand here. This is the center of rotation. Now on a shorter uh, thread we have an object of let's say mass m and it rotates with some uh, angular velocity uh, omega 1. Now, we also have in our hands a longer uh, thread which is basically also connected to the same should connect it to the same object but it's longer so this is R and this is capital R capital R is greater than lowercase r. So the lowercase r is stretched to full extent and the object is rotating and this one is just hanging basically, the longer one. Now at this particular point, let me put this point on at 12 o'clock, At this particular point, what we do is, this is our object, um, what we do at this particular point, we cut or let go the shorter uh, thread and see what happens. Well, the object was rotating around the circle. Um, and at this moment the connection was basically cut off and this connection is the only uh, uh, force basically the, ten the um, tension on this thread was the only force which uh, kept our object on its trajectory uh, centripetal force by the way it's called now um, so what happens at this particular point well, as soon as we cut this, there is no force which keeps our object on its circular uh, trajectory, which means that it will go on a tangential line towards infinity. However, we do have a longer thread which is also connected to this object, and this longer thread will not let this object to fly to infinity. It will stop it whenever this distance would be equal to r. So, 
So this is my new position of my object. Now this is the length of the uh, uh, longer thread and uh, we don't really keep this one, the, the, this shorter thread, it just hanging somewhere. Oh, you don't really need it. Okay. So what happened at this point? Well, intuitively we understand that at this point, since we stop the object short, something should really force it to go in the circular orbit of the radius r, right? Which is true. Well, let's consider um, how this is happening um, in, in more details. Now, the velocity of this particular object, v, is equal to lowercase r times its angular velocity, right? So this is my velocity. Well, any vector I can represent as a sum of two vectors, right? So one vector would be radial and another vector would be tangential. So one is along this radius, another is perpendicular to this radius. So this v as a vector is equal to sum of two vectors. Now let's see what happens when the tension of this thread starts actually playing its role. So at this moment um, of time when this object flying along the tangential line to a smaller circle, whenever it reaches the point which is on the distance capital R from a center, <coughs> its speed will be exactly the same as before. Omega 1. R times omega 1. Now let's consider this is angle phi. Well, this is angle phi, that means that this and this also are angle phi, phi, phi right? Am I right? Yes, I'm right. Because this is perpendicular to this, and this is perpendicular to this. Same thing here. So this is phi, and this is phi. And this is, by the way, pi over 2 minus phi, because it's a, uh, a right triangle, and this is also pi, pi over 2 minus phi. All right, so what happens with these two vectors? Well, the, uh, the tension of this, uh, of this thread will definitely affect this particular component of the vector, uh, uh, of the speed vector velocity vector v. It will stop, right? So this uh, radial component of the velocity will be stopped by the tension. Now, if the tension is t, then if we consider that the thread is very, very little stretchable, almost non-stretchable. So during a very short interval of delta t, this would be the impulse which actually which will actually be equal to mass times uh, this particular uh, radial component of the speed, right? Because in the beginning, this uh, moment uh, of inertia of this particular object in this direction is equal to m times vr, radial component. And at the end of deceleration, which is a very, very short deceleration, 
because the stretch, uh, th this particular thread is almost unstretchable, right? So during very short period of time, this would be nullified, right? So the impulse of um, this force will nullify this. That's why the whole impulse is equal to basically change of the speed, right? And the change of the speed is from MVR to, to zero, right? At the same time, this tension would not affect this component, uh, the tangential component of the initial um, um, vector of speed, right, vector of velocity, right? Now, so what actually happens is that the shorter this period of time, the closer uh, moment of nullifying the radial component of the speed would be to this particular point. And in some ideal situation, and we are talking about a thought experiment, which is ideal, and the um, thread is completely unstretchable, this moment of time actually be infinitely small, and, accel and, and deceleration uh, along this direction would be, well, <laughs> infinitely large, right? Because from certain uh, um, constant, uh, which is equal to VR, we are reducing speed to zero practically in, in, in an infinitesimal amount of time, right? So that's why acceleration, which is speed divided by time, would be uh, almost infinite, right? So in the ideal situation, and again, this is a thought experiment, we can consider that basically it stops exactly this movement along this uh, direction will be stopped exactly at the moment when uh, our uh, body has reached this point. So there is no stretching. Because if there is a stretching, then we will probably lose some energy, etc., etc. The situation would not be ideal. But in the ideal situation, there is no stretching. Now, all we have to do right now is to see that since this angle is phi, and that means that this component will be completely zero uh, down after our uh, thread stops this movement. So th this component, this component, radial component, will be brought to zero immediately, instantaneously. And this component will not be changed, because this tension force <coughs> doesn't really affect the movement along this direction. So, Vt, the tangential component, actually is equal to uh, V times uh, cosine phi, which is equal to, now what is the cosine? Well, look at this triangle. Obviously, this is uh, lowercase r. Obviously, uh, cosine phi is equal to r divided by r, right? So we can see this is r divided by r. Well, basically, that's almost it. Because what is our tangential speed if um, our uh, object is uh, circulating on the radius r? Well, obviously, this tangential speed is equal to r times omega 2, where omega 2 is the angular velocity um, of rotation uh, on a bigger circle, right? And V, in turn, is equal to R omega 1. And the cosine phi, cosine phi, is equal to R divided by R, right? We have already established that. Well, let's just substitute everything in this formula. What do we have? We have that Vt, which is R omega 2, is equal to V. And V is this, R omega 1, times R over R. Almost finished. Um, 
r square omega 1 is equal to r square omega 2, right? If you will multiply by r. So our angular speeds uh, are obviously changing and if radius has increased then the uh, angular, uh, angular velocity must decrease to preserve uh, this particular equality, right? And uh, not just uh, decrease, decrease um, inversely to radius square. Now this is almost um, law of conservation of momentum, of angular momentum, because if I will multiply it by m, by mass, I will have this. Now, what is this? This is a moment of angular, angular moment of inertia. A1, I1, omega 1 equals I2, omega 1, omega 2. So, this is angular moment of inertia, this is um, angular velocity, and their product is called angular momentum of rotation. And this is a proof that angular momentum of rotation is preserved. Okay, let me add um, a couple of more, more words. In the description to this lecture, on unizor.com, um, I will try to find this um, link to a small video which discusses some kind of experimental proof of this particular law that our angular velocity is inversely proportional to uh, square of the radius. So there was an experiment which if I will find this video, you will see it yourself. But basically, it's something like this. You consider a tube or something, then a thread. And on the thread, you have some kind of an object. And let's consider it's rotating at certain, um, at certain radius and at certain um, angular velocity. Now, and you measure basically it. What's the angular velocity? Just physically measure the, uh, th this velocity. Then if you will pull down this uh, thread and let's say shortening by the radius by half, in theory you should have increase of the rotation by the factor of four, right? Radius uh, uh, was, redu was reduced by 2, so our angular velocity should be by 2 squared, which is uh, 4. Now, what's interesting in this experiment is that if um, the person who conducts this experiment moves, pulls it slowly, he does not have this ratio of 4 times increase of the um, angular uh, velocity. But if he moves it fast, he does have this result. So this is a very interesting consideration and it's definitely a subject to think about. Because if you are moving it slowly, it doesn't really jump from one circular orbit to another. It actually moves along a spiral. And the spiral is, you know, it's a pretty long spiral if you are moving it slowly, right? And somewhere during this spiral movement, mo movement you cannot really make this picture which I did before, uh, before because the, the forces will not be directed exactly perpendicularly uh, to the trajectory. So, um, it, it, it's not easy to understand and uh, to tell you the truth, I myself, I, I don't have all the details, but since it, it's really obvious that experiment results depend on the speed, this spiral trajectory um, r r moving along the spiral trajectory is uh, supposed to waste certain amount of energy and that's why the final number of uh, rotations per unit of time, the, the angular speed, uh, would be less. 
but if you do it fast then you will have probably more or less as close as uh, as as close to ideal experiment as I had um, explained before. Well, um, that's it. I, I do suggest you to read the documentation, the, the description of this lecture on the website. And as I said, I will try to put to find actually this uh, website and point to to you. Um, and uh, I hope that would convince you that. Uh, angular momentum is conserved in ideal situations but if situation is not really ideal then you might expect actually that certain um, deviations obviously uh, would happen primarily deviations to a slower number of uh, uh, slower value of the um, angular speed if you reduce the radius or maybe greater if you will um, increase it by certain factor so the spiral rather than jump from one circular orbit to another is very important that's where we are losing our idealness of the situation and that's why you should not really expect um, this law to be really you know physically um, observable and another situation is if you are just rotating something on the thread and then you'll put a finger and the thread will uh, will go around the finger same thing it will go uh, along the spiral and the and and the width of the finger actually changes the direction of the forces in this case so again i do not um go through all the details and uh, there are some details of, of course uh, it, it can be done but it's probably kind of too involved let's just concentrate on the ideal situation and in the ideal situation experiment with two threads which by the way was recommended to me by uh, by my cousin who uh, I discussed certain things with um, that experiment actually this ideal experiment thought experiment uh, proves and um, you shouldn't have any reservations uh, against the thought experiment and uh, its ideals um, because um, Albert Einstein basically has come up with the special theory of relativity using only thought experiment so everything was in his mind basically he did not conduct any real experiments and the real confirmation experimental confirmation came much later all right so that's it for today thank you very much and good luck <laughs>